I'm Christian, and welcome to the Jamoir Leadership Podcast, a show where we talk about effective collaboration, influence, and leadership in an increasingly complex world. My interview partner is Dr. Dirk Schlimm. Dirk is an international leadership expert and the author of Influencing Powerful People. The purpose of this podcast is to share ideas and stimulate discussion, and it does not constitute professional advice of any kind. If such advice is needed, the services of a competent professional should be sought. The speakers, host, and Gemar International Incorporated are not to be held responsible for any use, misuse, or reuse of the content. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Gemar Leadership Podcast. We enjoyed our guests, David and Rick, during our past three episodes talking about boards and board dynamics, but today we're back in the world of management in the world of people who are actually running the company. Based on a very timely and topical article in the Wall Street Journal, today we want to explore a topic that is at the top of mind for many managers and professionals. How to get along with your boss, especially if you have a powerful and demanding boss. So, as a jump-off point for our episode today, we're looking at a story in the Wall Street Journal about Zach Kirkhorn, the CFO of Tesla. The story describes Mr. Kirkhorn's success in two critical areas. Firstly, moving behind the scenes, but nonetheless, important operational initiatives at Tesla forward. And secondly, navigating his boss, Elon Musk, a larger than life business person who probably epitomizes the idea of a powerful and demanding boss more than anyone. Dirk, why is this such an important topic and what can we learn from Mr. Kirkhorn? Yeah, uh, Christian, traditionally in the world of leadership development, the boss perspective has been uh, the focus. So the the question would have been, what can we as leaders learn from someone like Elon Musk and and people like him? What is it about their vision, their drive, their tenacity that that makes them more that makes them so so successful? And and that's an important and, and valuable perspective for sure. But what sometimes can be equally important, or maybe even more important, is to understand how can I be effective as a manager or as an executive when I'm not the big boss? In other words, who, how can I make the relationship with my boss work? Because depending on who your boss is, this can be quite challenging, and this can make a huge difference between success and failure. Thanks, Dirk. That already sounds interesting. A lot to learn here. But let me just ask an initial question. When you described what you just stated, are we talking about managing up in this case? Yes, in a way we are. But I must say, I don't really like that term very much. Please explain. Why not? (laughs) Why not? Well, managing up can suggest that the um, idea is that we have to be very political that we uh, you know that the, the manager who's managing up uh, that he or she has to try and unduly ingratiate themselves with their boss or they may be using their team's work to make themselves look good and and so on and and so in other words you know it, the, the term kind of suggests that the person may be pursuing their own agenda uh, to the detriment of uh, of those uh, of those around them Okay, Dirk, that makes a lot of sense. That clears that up. But just thinking to what you said, as you suggest in your intro, managing the boss is an important skill. So in this case, what do you have in mind? Well, especially when you're working for a powerful and demanding boss, or you know, for some people, for any boss, it, it can be quite challenging. They can be intimidating. They can lose patience with you. They mm-hmm. can have sky-high uh, expectations. And, and so the ability to work effectively with a demanding boss. Um, this this can be uh, super uh, important, but not just for the career interest of the person doing it, but also in the interest of moving important work forward. So it is in the interest of the broader team and company. And, and ultimately it's in the interest of uh, the boss themselves. And I think this is very much the point of the story uh, about Mr. Kirkhan, uh, at at Tesla, um, even the most powerful uh, person in the world or the most powerful business person in the world needs people who make them help their vision happen. They cannot uh, do it alone. Or as the Wall Street Journal article puts it, someone needs to keep the company rolling. Right, Dirk. Again, that's clear. So let me jump in here. 
You said that the manager working for the powerful person helps them make the vision happen. So my question, shouldn't the manager also bring a vision of their own? Yeah, uh, Christian, indeed, that's an excellent question. And I even would put this as a good starting point here for, for uh, the conversation. And, and, and we could even call this uh, the first uh, uh, important point that we want to discuss here when it comes to how to navigate a powerful boss well. And so the description of the working relationship between Mr. Musk and Mr. Kirkhorn highlights that Mr. Musk is the visionary and that it would be very hard uh, to have room for two uh, visionaries. And, and so Mr. Kirkhorn, as we, we read the article, he's happy to leave the vision and the limelight to Mr. Musk. And I don't think that means that he does not have unique perspectives and contributions of his own, uh, but he knows uh, that it's not about him, or at least it's not about him at this time. And this is a trait that I have observed in many people who work effectively with powerful people. They are comfortable to leave the limelight to others. Not that they cannot handle the limelight, but they know that this is not their role at this time. And this is a very valuable skill to have. You understand your role and you're comfortable in your role. Right, Dirk. And that makes sense. Again, very clear. But I'm thinking about it. Here we are talking about Mr. Kirkhorn. So wouldn't that speak to the reality that there are times when the person or the manager is asked to step into the limelight? What what do they do in that case? Yeah, and, and that's true. And as you say, the article does talk about that. And, and so, yes, sometimes someone has to step in for the boss because he or she has uh, the boss has an important uh, thing going on and or it is something that they don't that they don't like, right? So, what do we do in that case? Well, uh, and then it is important to be uh, comfortable with the limelight, but to still remember that you're not the star of the show. You can and must be confident, but you also should stick to the script, uh, so to speak. So, while you are, for example, a confident presenter, you should also be uh, prepared and comfortable saying that you may not be the right person to answer a question that comes after your presentation and so on. So. It's best to always assume that the occasion is being recorded because it might well be. And you want to be comfortable that you have kept everything as it should be and according to the role distribution in your company. Okay, great first piece of advice, Dirk. What's next? Well, what's next is that working for a powerful person is uh, very uh, demanding. And one of the traits you will find is that they have ideas and strong opinions on almost every area of the company. And so you have to feel comfortable engaging them and, and working with their ideas, even if something is your area of responsibility. So you cannot just say, hey, boss, that's my uh, area of expertise. Stay out of it. And so we read about Mr. Kirkhorn, um, that he's well educated with advanced degrees. He's very uh, confident uh, and, and competent. And he obviously has gained the trust uh, of, his, of his boss. But in my experience, even if you're that accomplished, if you're working with somebody of, of that stature, you have to feel comfortable with the scrutiny and involvement, even again, if something is your your area of, of responsibility and expertise in the company. Right, Dirk. So let, let's drill down there. You mentioned being comfortable with scrutiny at the end there. What does that actually mean? Well, a larger than life business personality will, will always be on a quest to improve things, make them better, uh, challenge the conventional wisdom. So a, a strong competency in your chosen field is key. We, we, we talked about that. But then you still have to have the willingness to engage the powerful boss and work with their ideas. So you have to kind of keep an open mind. Right. So where does the scrutiny come in? Well, you, you always want to be prepared when discussing a significant issue, especially if something that has some kind of controversy or, or downside uh, attached to it. So, uh, for example, I would not recommend acting on other people's say-so. Of, of course, you need uh, inputs from, from others, but you need to uh, be educated yourself. You need to educate yourself fully on the topic so you can defend this as your true opinion, not as a secondhand view. So again, be sure you fully understand the issue and you buy into the reasons that you have been provided with by, by other people. So this could be people on your team or this could be uh, experts, consultants, but but you have to be firm. You have to be at the level of saying, yes, this is uh, uh, my opinion now. I understand this. And so 
also then when you get into a, a, a discussion you want to stick with what you know and you do not want to get drawn into speculation and so it's better to say you know i need to look into this aspect some more uh, that's better than guessing or making uh conjecture and depending how important the issue is you may even want to prepare with somebody who argues the other side of the coin because there always is one and and so you need to be you need to be ready for that wow dirk that again that's clear, but it really does sound like a lot of preparation. Putting it in my terms, this sounds like you're suggesting that people be ready to almost defend a thesis. I think that's actually exactly what it's what it's like. Okay, well, a lot, but that's very helpful. So just bringing it back a little bit, in the intro, we talked about a larger-than-life boss like Mr. Musk being very demanding. So from there, what can we learn from Mr. Kirkhorn in this situation? Yeah, and, and Christian, that was probably for me one of the most interesting things that I read in the article, because again, it's something that I've seen so often myself. I had the visionary, uh, like Mr. Musk, throws out a big goal, and, and he or she doesn't tell you how to achieve that goal, and they may not even know how to achieve uh, the goal. So what do we do? Well, the article says that Mr. Kirkhorn has a unique skill in breaking down these big demands into manageable uh, pieces. And, and again, this is something I've seen as an absolutely critical skill. It is easy uh, to get intimidated um, or then say something like, oh, this cannot be done. Um, and because it looks like it, it cannot uh, be done, but but then the job is to to brainstorm. You know, you go away, how, how could this be done? What would it take? Uh, what can we do with what we have or what resources uh, could we pull pull in? Because a larger than life leader doesn't want to hear no, they want to hear how. Right. So I'm hearing you, Dirk, but with all due respect, that sounds a bit like promising things that you can't deliver. Yeah, Christian, you're right. And, and, and you don't want to do that. I want to clear you don't want to promise things you can't uh, deliver, but you can always say, hey, let me see what we can do. Let me get the team together and see how we can come up with a plan. So, so something that sounds as confident as you can be or or need to be, uh, because then the work really is to engage the team. And this can be an inside team, this can be outside people, but then come up with a plan. And most likely you will be surprised what actually is possible when you put uh, your mind to it, or you are clear what additional resources you need to come up with something, say, that is similar and that can be done and 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 so on. And so what you're doing here is you're, you're working with your vision and you're translating that vision into action. So you're operationalizing the vision, so to speak. And that, again, is a skill that's super uh, valuable. And again, it's something that, that Mr. Kirkhorn seems to excel at. Wow, very impressive. Do we have time for one more, Dirk? Sure. Uh, the the one last thing that really struck me when, when reading about Mr. Kirkon is his ability to uh, uh, communicate. Right. Communication. We talk about that a lot. It's always important. Uh, yes, it is. And in this instance, <laughs> Christian, it's even, it's, even, it's even more important. Well, tell us how that is, Dirk. Well, Mr. Musk is the quintessential techno entrepreneur. And so he speaks a certain language. He, he, he does not speak the language of diplomacy or the language of uh, bureaucracy. And so if you speak that language, you will not get uh, very far. So what about Mr. Kirkhorn then? What what does he have to do in this situation? Yeah, well, the, the article tells us that Mr. Kirkhorn and Mr. Musk studied overlapping discipline. Uh, Mr. Kirkhorn studied engineering and economics, and Mr. Musk studied physics and also economics. And, and so that gives the two of them a common language. And is that a challenge that happens often, communicating in a common language? Yeah, I, I, uh, Christian, I think so. I recall uh, working uh, with a team that was uh, reporting to a very hard-driving senior uh, um, executive, and she really did not like people to be long-winded. And so we're working on a project uh, at, at that point, and I told the team that, hey, look, you know, the boss, she could drop by here at any moment, and we then have to be ready to provide a brief update. And that sounds like there might be a story there. What what happened? Yeah, wow. Well, um, so that's uh, what happened is exactly what, what was anticipated. The executive walked 
unannounced into the meeting room right. and uh, um, asking, hey, what are you guys, you know, working on what's going on here? You know, all the suspicious people may be wasting their time in a, in a meeting. And so we had a short update ready and we had some questions for her to confirm her direction. And she walked out of there with a good feeling that, no, these people were not uh, wasting time. They were in a meeting, but we were, you know, hitting the issues one by one. We were uh, focused and we were working in a no-nonsense, uh, efficient manner. Right. So that worked out quite nicely. You were ready for the unexpected or the impromptu drop-in. Exactly. And, and and that is just, you know, one, one example. In this case, a person wanting a, a brief and crisp and concise um, update and and making things crisp sometimes takes more time than uh, making them uh, long winded. But more broadly, you must know how your boss communicates. Do they want a written update in an email? Do they want a formal briefing note? Do they want a chat? Do you want a quick video call? A knock on the door of the office, or you know, these days a knock on on the table of their their workstation? Do they want prose, bullet points, graphs, charts? Do they want to know what Chat GPT had to say about the issue? So. Do they speak technology, finance, growth, profits, values, et cetera? So, so you have to have that common language, and it's up to you to know what it is and to learn it. And that really is that really is foundational. Dirk, thank you so much. That does sound foundational and very important, and as always, very practical. Anything else here? Well, there's obviously a lot of nuance here and much will depend on the industry um the stage in your career your geographical culture and and so on but but what i've learned over the years is how central the relationship with the boss is and how we must take responsibility for making it as good as it, as it can be uh, you'd be surprised lots of people complain about their boss and and i will say often rightly so um, but then it comes back to us. What can we do to improve the relationship? How can we take responsibility for making the relationship as productive as it can be? And and this really is a worthwhile effort. And again, it's something uh, where we can learn from the likes of Mr. of Mr. Kirkhan here. Thanks, Dirk. That was amazing. But unfortunately, we are drawing to a close here. So let me take some time just to briefly summarize those key practical points you brought up, Dirk. So firstly, working for a powerful or demanding boss can be quite challenging for both the sake of our own career interest and simply for moving work forward in the company. To that end, we need to understand and be comfortable in our roles. Depending on the boss and the company's needs, this could mean taking a step forward or taking steps back when it comes to the limelight or even our own vision. Secondly, working for a powerful person we need to recognize that they'll have strong opinions about nearly every aspect of the company. So we should grow comfortable with engaging with them and working with their ideas, even when it's our area of expertise. That will mean growing comfortable with scrutiny. A powerful person is likely to want to always be working on improvement. So keep an open mind and be prepared, truly prepared for their input. Thirdly, and this one is quite important. When working with a demanding boss, we should take it in stride when they come with seemingly impossible tasks. We spoke about sky-high expectations. Don't be intimidated. Break them down and see how you can make them work. And this time, we normally have three points, but today we have four, so bear with me. Our final point here is that key to a relationship with a demanding or powerful boss is communication. Know how your boss communicates. Do they like emails, the quick video call, or set and detailed meetings? Do they think in terms of finance and profits or technology or growth? Or do they have some big purpose of the business? Get to know your boss, how they communicate, and act accordingly. Dirk, how does all that sound? I think, Christian, that sounds great. Thanks so much for the summary. No, Dirk, thank you so much for, for sharing your advice and practical steps we can implement here with uh, demanding or powerful bosses. So everyone, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us again on the Gemoir Leadership Podcast. It's always a pleasure to put these out. And we encourage you, if you enjoy this, please like this, share this, and pass it along to a friend. And of course, most importantly, if you're able to, let us know what you're thinking. Give us some feedback. We'd love to hear from you and truly make this a, a community where we're growing and thinking practical together. But that's all the time we have for today. Join us again in a couple of weeks on the Gemoir Leadership Podcast. 
Until then, take care.